anyone that wants to make the change, yeah, do a bit of research before you do it. Because when you leave the city and you come, you know, to a rural area, it is different. And, you know, you can get frustrated by certain things because you don't have the simplicity of access to everything that you have in the city. And you have to learn to deal with that. Um, but on the other side of it, the pluses and, and the lifestyle are incredible. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The lure of the seaside, the golden sands, the waves of deep blue washing upon the shore. It's not hard to understand why many Australians live along our vast coastline. With regional tourism booming, the chance to live the dream, plying your trade and escaping the big smoke is very real and very rewarding. Andy Davies is the owner of Chef Andy Davies. Andy, how are you going, mate? Well, Anthony, how are you? Good, mate. You uh, escaped the big smoke um, for the beautiful uh, blue waves and golden sand up in Noosa quite a few years back. Uh, what, what, what drew you to that location originally? Uh, look, I'd been up here a lot when I was a kid. Uh, lucky enough that uh, my parents brought us up here. Um, my brother made the move about 20 years ago and I made the move with my family about five and a half years ago. As you know, I was in Bondi for, you know, 30, 30 odd years, I think, and um, just had enough of the big city and Noosa has always been close to my heart and it's a very much an international food hub now. It's just got a great reputation for food. So it wasn't uh, wasn't a hard decision. Well, as you say, you spent 30 years at Bondi. You've you've really t- taken advantage of living and working on the coast and by the sea. Um, is that important to you in, in regards to chefing? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, it's important to my lifestyle because I'm a big person uh, that spends a lot of time in the water uh, to keep, obviously to keep fit, but surfing. And I just like being near the ocean but the other thing is um, it's the attraction of you know what comes out of the ocean as well and up here as you know uh, from Mooloola right up to the coast um, there is incredible offerings and the the seafood that you can get your hands on up here is just world class. Well you spent the last um, well quite a few years making a real impression on the local culinary landscape up there with multiple restaurants. What's it like being part of that sort of thriving food community over the last five to 10 years? Yeah, look, that is, it, it is a, a heaving um, town when it comes to restaurants and, and people, um, you know, people think that uh, Noosa is only busy in the season holiday times, but it's not, it just goes th- right throughout the year. Um, because it's, you know, within Australia, it's right up there. It's one of the top destinations to go to. Even with the restrictions on travel, I've never seen it so busy. Um, there is people everywhere enjoying Noosa for what it is. I mean, geographically, it's an incredible landmark, also with the, the river system and the hinterland, but as well as the incredible surf beaches and, and the national parks and all that sort of stuff. So being associated with the lifestyle up here and the restaurants has been it's been incredible. Were there challenges involved at first moving your sort of brand and culinary sort of take to the region? Did you sort of take note of what, having to do something a bit different? Yeah, I think so. I mean, this was the first position I'd held for a while where I didn't own the restaurant as well. And that, you know, that's always challenging um, when you're working for people um, trying to fit into their program. I, I ended up working for a a restaurant group that has four restaurants in it and that's called the Ogilvy Group and it's it's a very powerful business and they have a very good brand. Um, but it was all about me implementing my philosophy, I suppose, into what, what I like to do and also how I run kitchens. And um, you're dealing with different um, staff when you go to rural areas as well as opposed to the city because if you sort of have to try and manipulate with what you've got you just can't think there's endless resources of staff because there isn't and it's a matter of there's a lot more training that goes into it and a lot more you have you really have to persevere focus on their strengths and try and help them with their weaknesses what were some of the issues that you had in setting up up there you know irrelevant of sort of introducing your take on cuisine 
Um, well, I wouldn't say that was so much as issue. First thing I did was build relationships with the suppliers and the locals, and that took me a while to get my arms around that sort of side of it. Um, and then because Locale was, you know, sort of modern Italian, I'd just come from doing an Italian restaurant in Bondi for 10 years. So the transition there was quite smooth um, and it was also very high volume. And I've always been used to um, submersing myself in restaurants that do high volume. So that side of it was quite an easy transition. Um, I think it's also understanding your market up here. And it was, you know, holiday makers um, are a different market in a lot of ways when you come to a tourist town like Noosa. And, and I learned to adapt to that pretty quickly as well. As you mentioned, you spent 30 years on Bondi Beach and 10 of it was at Bondi Trat where you really made a name for yourself in Sydney. Um, what was it like working in Bondi, uh, trying to run a restaurant in that environment? Oh, it was, uh, it was amazing. I mean, uh, forever busy being on the Esplanade with a view of the surf right across the road from the icebergs. Um, you know, it was incredible. I mean, when I first got into Bondi, it was 1986. I think there was two or three restaurants in Bondi. Now there's probably 150 food outlets or even more. So um, the change, and that was in, in the late 80s. I mean, I in the last 10 years, there were dramatic changes as well, but it was incredible. Um, you know, there was so many incredibly high times and then you had to nav navigate your way through winter as well. But so that some of the winter times were also amazing as well to come down to the beach and, and see those incredible winter storms and sit in the restaurant and watch people enjoy it while they're having, you know, some really warm, hearty food was incredible. And uh, as you know, the kitchen I had there was elevated. So an incredible view. It was amazing. Um, I do miss Bondi in a lot of ways, but it was getting, you know, hectic as well. And just the traffic and the noise and the overflow of people, the infrastructure was struggling to handle it, I felt. And it was becoming hard to live there. And I lived, you know, 10 seconds from the restaurant. So I lived right next door. You can imagine the noise and all that sort of stuff. But it was an amazing time. I mean, I had three different um, restaurants in Bondi in my time. But the trap was definitely um, a great time. The sports bar was as well. I mean, I had that for eight years too. And that was in the 90s. And that was fantastic. So, yeah, I've seen a lot in Bondi. And I've seen a lot of changes, some for the good and some for the bad. Can you take us back to when you first got an interest in food? What, what was the trigger that led you to seek out a career as a chef? Oh, was no question. It was my mother. Um, she was lucky enough that, well, we were lucky enough that she didn't have to work. My dad is a general practitioner. He's in, in medicine. So mum uh, could organise a different meal every night of the week by the time we got home from school and, and went surfing or whatever we did, we came home and she'd always be cooking up something that she read about. She had the cookbooks out. She had a big kitchen, big pantry. Um, and, you know, she used to go out shopping and look for the best stuff she could find and she'd make her own pickles and preserves and all that sort of stuff. And her mother was a great cook and that's where she learnt that from and she grew up in the Clare Valley. So... I used to get home from school, I think I was nine or ten at the time, and help her in the kitchen, and I just loved it. And uh, on top of that, we were fortunate enough that Dad, Mum and Dad would take us out every couple of weeks for a meal in a restaurant, and I was just fascinated with restaurants. I just found them really exciting. And um, back in those days, the kitchens were always hidden away. So, you know, every time you went to the loo or whatever, you tried to sneak past the kitchen and see what was going on. And it was incredibly exciting, you know. And then nowadays, of course, all the kitchens are front and centre, so it's different. But I just got the bug. I really had my eyes set on nothing else but, but wanting to be a chef from probably the age of 10 or 11. You've worked at some amazing restaurants and had some of your own amazing establishments, but you also spent time with Neil Perry at Blue Water Grill. Can you take us back to that period? Wow, they were colourful times. Um, <laughs> 1980, 1986, I, I'd, I'd been at the Bayswater Brasserie and I hadn't long 
been in Sydney and Neil also was a student of the Bayswater Brasserie, which, you know, back in those times, that was the restaurant. I mean, that was a true brasserie doing 300 plus on a Monday night. And that was, that was a great uh, initiation for me to learn my speed and learn to work in a big, full flowing kitchen, like a proper kitchen. You know, I came from Adelaide where we were, you know, doing 60 people on a Saturday night sort of thing, which, you know, which is great. But I just liked the buzz of working in a, in a high volume place that was turning tables, you know, lots of staff, um, lots of noise. And then when I went on to work with Neil, I was already sort of up to speed, I suppose. And the Blue Water was a big, busy restaurant and it, it broke the mould. I mean, that was incredible. Some of the staff that worked there, they've all gone on to do incredible things, you know. Um, it was, and they were all there when I arrived. You know, we were all there in the late 80s and, you know, some of the, the wait staff were working there during the week because they worked at Barrow Waters on the weekend and, and it was just this influx of all these talented people, you know, Sussman and, and uh, Kuravita and Johnny Vanderbeer and Lorraine Godsmark and all these people were there and it was just, we rode a wave and it was incredible. And Neil, just with his take on what modern Australian seafood should be, simplicity and barbecuing and sourcing stuff from interstate direct to the back door and stuff, it changed the face of Australian cuisine. There's no doubt about it. Your time at Bondi Trap um, made a real impression on Sydney dining and you had a signature dishes, which you probably might be quite sick of now, like the raw tuna pasta. Um what what was it like cooking in that tiny kitchen, creating those dishes? Did you did you feel a pressure to change the menu, or is it, or do you like to hold on to those sort of dishes? The the Bondi Sports Bar, yes, it was a tiny kitchen, so I sort of developed a smaller menu, but I tried to um, put on some food which I thought suited Bondi and suited the time. Um, you know, suited people that had spent a day on the beach and then came in with their swimmers still on and a towel over the shoulder and sand in their hair and that sort of stuff. And that's where the angel hair pasta with raw tuna came about. And I still cook that to this very day. You know, I do it for um, some of the private dining guests that I've got now and people are asking me for it. It's certainly travelled with me as I've made my travels to Noosa. Um, I love that dish and I'll, I'll never get sick of cooking it. And there's other dishes that, you know, mightn't have the notoriety of that dish that I still draw on to this day, you know, even dishes that I did um, back in the late 80s. And, and, and that's the beauty of cooking. You know, you can always draw on, on stuff that you've seen or picked up and then you can twist it a bit and reinvent it or whatever. But as long as you've got the great produce that is the main component, you know, you're ready to go. You've uh, left the restaurant game in a way, uh, no longer working in a restaurant, you've gone out on your own. Can you tell us what drove that decision? When, um, yeah, I can. It was it was an interesting time because we got locked down for COVID and then my phone started going off and people were wanting, you know, a chef to come to their house to do a small dinner and a celebration and everything else. And, and we weren't locked down for long up here, mind you. It, it, we weren't like the cities. It didn't last very long and we sort of got back into it. But that was sort of – and I'd been thinking about it because I'd done a few one-off gigs over the years for people, regular customers or close friends and stuff. And I did a few and I thought – and, you know, my partner, Lee, she said, this is, this is your calling. You know, people want this. And up here there's a hell of a lot of – um, very high-end luxury holiday rentals. And, um, you know, I just knew it was a matter of getting my name in the door with these properties, which I've managed to do. And the, one thing just led to another, and it's just been snowballing. So, um, yeah, it's something that I thought about doing. And then sometimes you just got to back yourself and you just pull the trigger. And it's been the last couple of months, it's just been incredible. You mentioned earlier that you like big venues with a lot of energy and a lot going on. How big a transition has it been for you mentally moving from that kind of environment to doing um, so specific sort of smaller catered events? It's been great because, um, you know, up to a point I do them by myself and then once I go past sort of um, a certain number, let's say it's 15 or something, then I pull somebody else in to come in with me and I've got a great team. 
people that have worked with me in the past up here. So that's also the service staff as well as um, in the kitchen. Um, because you do everything yourself, it does keep you pretty busy, especially if you're doing, you know, like I'm doing one tomorrow night, which is an eight-course degustation. So, that, you know, you, you do have to work quite quickly and fast when you're doing it on your own. Um, sometimes I serve the customers as well, and I also – um, talk to them a lot about the dish and the produce and where it comes from. And I love doing that as well. A lot of it's about engaging with the client. I mean, they really want to know what's going on and, and the history of the dish and how it came about and where it got the produce from. And people love all that stuff. Um, yeah, it is different from, you know, my last posting at Locale. I didn't even cook at night. I mean, it was that busy. I was just doing the pass. So it's kind of great to be back cooking again and really getting my hands into it. I'm loving that. And also the relationships I'm building with a lot of these people that are engaging me to come to these properties and cook for them has been amazing. And I'm just getting a lot of repeat business and building these great friendships in a way with these people as well, which has been uh, just awesome. We sort of mentioned how you really like to uh, use fresh produce, particularly seafood, and you also – worked in a lot of Italian-based restaurants with your cuisine. Can you give us an idea of a dish or two, sort of where you're at now and what you're doing with, with Chef Andy Davies? Um, yeah, well, one thing that I've sort of gone back to, and this is a, a, a lot of the food that I learned through Neil in particular, is I'm starting to do a lot more Asian-influenced food now. I mean, I was in that um, bracket of Italian food when I was at La Cali and I was at the Trat. And now I can just, you know, I can just be a lot more freestyle and just do whatever I want. But I do love doing um, crudo and a lot of raw dishes, which, you know, just lets the produce up here shine. It's particularly, you know, say, for example, the Walker's yellowfin tuna, um, the Harvey Bay scallop, which I love getting my hands on. And they are wonderful to be eaten raw. Um, just and the scarlet prawn, which is just down the road as well, all these sorts of um, products are just amazing. I love doing raw food, but at the same time, you know, there's incredible organic quail up here and all sorts of things. So it's certainly opened the parameters a bit for me to to do different food as well. And I'm starting to really enjoy that. The pandemic has had a, quite a monumental impact on the restaurant industry. Uh, and a lot of people have taken the chance for to use change and adapt to change in their lives. What sort of impact do you think this period of time will have on the industry? Um, I don't know. How long is a piece of string? I mean, it's it's had a huge impact already, but people have adapted really quickly to it. Um, I think kitchens and restaurants and, and people within the business and, and restaurateurs are all thinking about the future and how they can be smarter and, and better at what they're doing. Um, you just have to adjust. I mean, when we were going through it, the first thing we did was reduce the size of the menu. Then we reduced the amount of staff. And when you're doing, you know, um, all of a sudden doing 80 people at a time and before we were doing 160, um, you have to adjust to try and um, make it profitable. Uh, that was the first thing. Um, yeah, it's well, there's a long, long way to go. I think, I mean, it's not like they're going to spray this mist over the population with the vaccine and everything's going to be great. It's, I don't believe that's going to happen at all. I think international travel is written off for a while, so we have to focus on the market that we have within Australia, and that's a huge market. And, and you can see that by places like Byron, for example, and, and Noosa have just been absolutely exploding. A lot of suppliers are telling me that they were 40% up on the year before. Um, so that means that they've adapted well and they are, you know, getting used to what the restrictions are. Um, it's just a matter of adjustment, I think. And you talk to a lot of people as well and you get ideas from other people. You can't just think you can do it all on your own. You need to interact with people in the industry and listen. Sometimes it's better not to say anything and it's better to listen to what people say and then you go away and make your own assumptions and adjustments. And I think a lot of people have done that very well. Some not so well, but a lot of people have been quite smart and a lot of people have benefited very well through this period. 
There's a lot of people seeking change during this time with their careers, and you've had a, an amazingly successful transition from the city um, up to Noosa. What, what sort of advice would you have for people looking for that kind of tree change in the hospitality sector? Um, well, I mean, always go and test the water before you, you pull up stumps and move there. That's the first thing. <laughs> and I've spent many, many years coming to Noosa, so I was very familiar with the area. Um, before I did it, I certainly rang um, some great friends who were great chefs up here, Peter Kuravita, for example, and spoke to him in length about how he went through that change. And my late great mate, uh, Gary Skelton, who's no longer with us, I also spent a lot of time with him. And, yeah, they sort of guided me through that transition and sort of gave me the ins and outs and the, and the good oil about this town. But I knew the town quite well anyway. Um, anyone that wants to make the change, yeah, do a bit of research before you do it. Because when you leave the city and you come, you know, to a rural area, it is different. And, you know, you can get frustrated by certain things because you don't have the simplicity of access to everything that you have in the city and you have to learn to deal with that. Um, but on the other side of it, the pluses and, and the lifestyle are incredible. You know, the, and the, where I live up here, it's just the ocean and, and everything surrounding me. It's just, I mean, you drive 15, 20 minutes in any direction and you just run into these incredible places and it's just wonderful. Um, and at the same time, you're only an hour and, 40 minutes from Brisbane. So if you do have to go to the city, well, it's not far away. You've made the big leap to have a major change in your career. Do, do you feel like it's given you longevity, uh, this transition? And do you have uh, some ideas and something in the pipeline for Chef Andy Davies moving forward? Yeah, I think it does give me longevity. I mean, um, I'm not getting any younger and the work I was doing <laughs> at... Locale was very demanding physically and mentally. It it was full on. It was such an animal of a restaurant, so busy. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to make a change. I want to spend more time with my girls. I've got a nine-year-old daughter and a lovely wife. And I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to have to work 60 hours a week. Um, now, if I can get myself two or three good gigs a week, I'm financially way better off than what I was before. Um, and it allows me to have more time to enjoy. But also I am focusing on uh, growing my brand and, um, you know, getting the Andy Davies brand out there, whether it's through a product or just, yeah, expanding. And I think that is not far off. I've been talking to quite a few people about that up here and, and it's exciting times ahead. Well, mate, it sounds really exciting and um, I, I hope one day I get to come up there and enjoy the spoils of uh, your cooking like I used to at Bondi Trat. Uh, I still cook your uh, raw tuna angel hair pasta at home, though it's not quite as good as yours. Um, loved having you on Deep in the Weeds today, mate. Please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. It's been a pleasure, Anthony, and uh, I hope to see you in Noosa someday soon, mate. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>